Feeling it? Awesome. Okay, good. That was cool. I enjoyed, that was fun. I like that one. That was better than other times we've had. So that's good. Participation. Okay. A couple weeks ago, we started kind of a new series. Hey, John. It's my friend. Hi. You've been away a while. Sorry. <clears throat> Got distracted. A couple weeks ago, we are going, we uh, started a new series. And we're talking about, we spent months talking about Jesus. Jesus as a person. His personality, his, his qualities, his characteristics, his virtues, all those kind of things. And all of that was just a great way to know Jesus and to love him, to be excited about him. But one of the greatest ways to know anybody, and, and, and Jesus, obviously, most of all, is to know what's in somebody's heart, to know what's in Jesus' heart. And so we're going to be looking at the heart of Jesus, things that Jesus held very dearly, things that he held as really important. And some of those things, as we go along, were pretty unique to him and have made a huge difference in the world today. Uh, but this morning, uh, last, a couple weeks ago, we started off the way Jesus started off, which was we looked at the kingdom of God. And uh, this morning, we're going to look at something a little bit different, not directly connected, but super important. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 9, and we'll read verses 18 to 31. Okay, and I got, I just got new glasses. Styling, yes, but they're the, what do you call them, progressive lenses? Oh my gosh, they're weird. Anybody have those? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't nod your head because then everything goes weird on you. So this is new. I haven't practiced this. Okay, sorry. Let us turn to the word of God, shall we? We're in business. Okay, Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 to 31. While Jesus was saying these things, he had been doing a lot of teaching, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died. But... Come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly, a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. And Jesus turned, and and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly, the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and and the crowd making commotion, just again, uh, you probably have seen it, you know, the Middle Eastern morning, right? Grief, you know, they really get into it. They'd even hire people to be professional grievers, and they go, woo, 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 and they do all kinds of stuff. So that's what's going on. Flute players and a crowd making a commotion. Jesus said, go away. <laughs> go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And I always wondered about that. I thought, you know, the depth of their grief. Okay, they're laughing at him now. But when the crowd had been put outside, get out, he went in and took her by the hand And the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout the district. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying loudly, Have mercy on a son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, Let it be done to you. And their eyes were opened. Then Jesus sternly ordered them, See that no one knows of this. But, of course, they went away and spread the news about him throughout the district. The end. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Precious Lord, we love you. And we thank you so much for your word. Lord Genesis, all the way through Revelation, we give you thanks because you've revealed yourself to us. you revealed your heart to us and the heart of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to be open to your word so that our hearts may be like yours. 
We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Evidently, there is something of a stereotype out there. And that stereotype goes something like this, that men and their gadgets are just, men are just crazy about gadgets. They're crazy about gadgets in general. They're crazy, most of all, about their remote. And I, I, I honestly, I, I know it's a stereotype. I, I only, I, you know, okay, maybe. I get it. We, at home, we've got direct TV. Okay, that's our service. And, and there's a remote that looks exactly like that. And sure, it's, it's nice. It's, I appreciate it. it. With that remote, I can change the channels. I can uh, control the volume. I can set the little DVR for recording if you wanted to record something. And, it, and it's fine, but I don't obsess about it. I don't. What I would obsess over is a remote control that can control the channels, the volume, and the DVR, but also run my computer, do my stereo, control the light dimmers in the living room. That'd be cool. You can kind of like do that. Mr. Coffee, the microwave oven, maybe run the vacuum around the house. Put the kids to bed. Now that is a remote. And, you know, I might get excited about that. But here's the thing, no matter what that remote did, no matter how many options it had, how many bells and whistles, none of it would mean a thing if it didn't have batteries, right? No matter how many add-ons and different things and all the apps and all the other things, not a, none of it would matter if it didn't have batteries. Without batteries, it would just be a big hunk of plastic. We now live in a society that is completely dependent on electricity, on power to operate all of the myriads of gadgets that we have built our lives on. And we all know that without power, everything, everything would come to an instant standstill. Everything works fine as long as it stays plugged in, as it stays connected to the source of power. This is true. It's true about our mundane lives. But here's the thing. It's also true about our spiritual lives. If we don't stay plugged in to our source of spiritual power, our hearts and our lives will become limp and lifeless. This is a big part of Jesus' teaching, a big focus of his work throughout the Gospels. But when Jesus talked about this, he talked in terms of faith. Faith is at the heart of everything. Jesus described faith for us. He inspired faith. He praised people for their faith. And he cr criticized people for their lack of faith. As we saw two weeks ago, Jesus began his ministry by saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. So, repent and believe. Repent and put your faith in the good news of the kingdom. Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God. He embodied the kingdom of God. He demonstrated the kingdom of God. And he called us to respond to the kingdom of God and to respond with faith. So, what is faith? What was Jesus talking about when he called us to put our faith in him? We've talked about this before, but this morning I want us to dig a little deeper. Okay, so looking at faith, we always begin with belief. Belief is the foundation that we build everything else on when we talk about faith. So belief is basically understanding something, coming to an understanding of something, and accepting that understanding as true. There are all kinds of things that we believe in. We gain understanding about things. We do it pretty systematically. We do it by seeing something, by observing it, by measuring it, and then we document our, our observations and we establish all of that as fact. And then, once we've done all that, we put our faith in those facts. That's, that's kind of how things operate. But when the Bible talks about faith, it goes beyond these basic facts. In fact, 
It talks about things that we can't always see, things we can't always measure. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. We can't establish these facts in the same way in the physical world. We can't, but, but, but we can come to understand them, and, and understanding them, to believe in them. Think about it. We, we believe in the existence of God. God, a God who is unique, a God who is infinite and eternal, a God who is all-powerful and all-knowing and all-good, a God who created all things, including us, and a God who loves us and who values us. We believe in that. We put our faith in this God. We believe that the man, Jesus of Nazareth, was and is and always will be the Son of God. And because he loved us and, and, and valued us so much, Jesus died on the cross for our sins and, and became the Savior of the world. And Jesus rose again on the third day and became the Lord of heaven and earth. We believe all of this and, and a lot more about Jesus. In fact, Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. All through the Gospels and down through the centuries, Jesus has been making himself known to us, helping us to understand the truth of him, calling us to accept and, and believe in that truth, to put our faith in that truth, and to embrace that truth with joy. There's a great story in the Gospel of John. There was a man who had been born blind, and, and, and Jesus had never talked to this man. Uh, the man didn't even know who Jesus was, but Jesus came up to the man. Again, he's blind, right? So he's not seeing Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He spits in the dirt. And, and, and maybe the guy's like, did I hear spitting? And the guy, and, and he makes mud, and he walks up to the guy and just goes, puts the mud on the guy's eyes and face, and then tells the guy, go and wash in the pool. Now, I'm just trying to put myself in the situation here. Here's a blind guy on the side. He's begging, and some guy makes mud and smears it on his face. He doesn't know who he is, right? Remember, that's important. The whole thing must have been a little weird. So, the guy does, I mean, he's got money on his face. He goes to the pool. He washes it off. And then what happens? He could see. A lot happens in the story. But finally, Jesus comes to the man and, and Jesus says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man says, Who is he? Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, You have seen him, which is pretty good because he made him so he could see. He said, you have seen him, and the one speaking to you right now is he. And the man said, Lord, I believe. The man who had been healed came to understand who Jesus was. In understanding, he accepted it as true. He put his trust in that truth, and that is what belief is. That is what faith is. Now, the reason that this is so important, there we go, the reason this is so important putting, is that putting our faith in Jesus connects us with Jesus, and it allows his power to move freely in us and, and ultimately through us. We see this all through the Gospels. There's a couple of phrases that Jesus repeats over and over again in the Gospels. Phrases like, your faith has made you well, or according to your faith, let it be done to you. In our passage, we see this three times in a row. There's a Jewish leader whose daughter has just died, but he's so desperate to have her restored that he puts his faith in Jesus. Obviously, he'd already put his faith in Jesus since he leaves the, the, the body of his dead daughter and runs after trying to find Jesus. He puts his faith in Jesus and pursues Jesus and finally, ultimately, brings Jesus back to his house. And in, in the Gospel of Mark, we read uh, Matthew, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says, do not fear, only believe. 
The Father's faith made the connection, and the power of God came. And we know the story. The daughter was restored to life. Woman with a hemorrhage, desperate after 12 years, 12 years of bleeding, sneaks up behind Jesus. Talk about faith. She's awesome. She says, if I only just touch the fringe of his cloak, I will be made well. That's, that's, that's faith. Sneaks up behind Jesus. I mean, I don't know what's going on. Maybe she's trying to like pull one over on him. I don't know. Sneaks up behind Jesus, touches his cloak, and that faith makes that connection. Jesus says, take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And I threw in there the next few verses in our reading this morning. Two blind men. It's too good. These guys are hollering at the top of their lungs. Have mercy on a son of David. Have mercy on us, Messiah, King. And Jesus says, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they say, yes, Lord. That's why we're yelling at you all the time. And Jesus says, then according to your faith, let it be done to you. And through that connection of faith, the power came. And they were healed. They were restored. Faith is like plugging a cord into a socket, making the connection, allowing the electricity to move. Or even better, I was thinking about this. Faith is like a plasma ball. You guys know about plasma balls? I love plasma balls. They're like these little glass balls. And, and they're so cool. There's like all this energy going on, you know, around in the ball, right? And it's so cool. But once you touch the ball, once you touch the ball, you make a connection, and all of that energy is directed right into your finger. It doesn't hurt, though. It's okay. Not, not usually. So, I think the whole thing's totally cool. God is everywhere. His power is all around us, constantly at work, holding everything together. But once we put our faith in him, we make a connection, we open up the conduit, and his power enters our lives in a, in a special way. And once that happens, all kinds of amazing things begin to happen. Jesus said, everything is possible for the one who believes. Our faith in him opens the way for his power to enter our lives. And what do we know about his power? There's a lot of it. His power is unlimited and inexhaustible. And so the reality is that, yeah, through faith, everything really is possible in our lives. So faith makes that connection. And of course, that connection, the connection through faith makes possible the most important thing of all. Jesus is clear that it is only through faith in him that we can find the salvation that we need so dearly. Jesus said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever disobeys the Son will not see life, but must endure the wrath to come. The principle is the same. Faith makes the connection. Faith plugs us in to that power source so that what Jesus accomplished on the cross, that power of God's grace, can become effective in our lives. Romans 3, 23 to 25 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if it stopped there, then we're in a lot of trouble. But, it says, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God put him forward as an atoning sacrifice through his blood, which is made effective through faith. In Romans 1, 16, Paul says, The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. God has done so much to offer us his salvation. He gave us his precious, only begotten son as a sacrifice on our behalf. And faith is what makes that sacrifice effective in our lives. It what connects us with the power of God's grace so that we can 
have life. Life now and life forever. And all of this is why Jesus was so fixated on faith. Why he talked about it so much and why he worked so hard to inspire it in our hearts. Because faith makes possible everything that Jesus wants to accomplish in our lives. It is the absolutely essential connection. And because of that, uh, his challenge is that we should not only have faith, but we should be constantly growing in our faith. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus criticized his disciples for being little faiths. You know the passages I'm talking about? There's a bunch of them. Uh, there was a time when they were freaking out in the boat because the storm had come and Jesus was asleep. And he wakes up and like, what? And then, he, and then he says, why you guys have such little faith? And then he tells the storm to be quiet. Time when Peter was, was actually walking on the water. Now give the guy credit. Would you have stepped out of the boat? Not me. But then, you know, he's like, oh, everything's happening. And he starts sinking and, and, and you know, Jesus saves him first before criticizing him, which was kind. And then he says, Peter, why? Why did you have such little faith? The time when they were trying to cast the demon out of this little boy. Jesus like, you couldn't do it because you have such little faith. He says over and over again, O ye of little faith. And his criticism points us to a reality. And it's a good reality. It's a reality that faith can grow. If, if, he, if that was it, if we were just little faiths, then he wouldn't bother mentioning it. But he says it so that we would be inspired to try to grow and develop our faith. This is good news for us. Because I don't know about you, but I know that Jesus would call me a little faith. I know that because he actually has. Uh, lately in my prayers, Jesus has been interrupting me, and that's weird. Have you ever been interrupted in your prayer? It's been happening lately, and it's, it's a little annoying, but I'm not going to complain. And Jesus says, I'm praying away, oh God, you know, stuff's hard, whatever. And he's like, do you trust me? He's been saying, honest to goodness, I mean, I'm, uh, not audibly, but I'm hearing it in my heart. He's like, okay, what, yeah, do you trust me? I'm like, of course I trust you, Lord. You hold everything in your hands, and I believe that, and I really do believe that. He says, yeah, I know you trust me with the big picture. But do you trust me with the little things? Do you trust me with the things that you've actually been praying about? The things that you're worrying about? The things that you're confused about? The things that you're, that you're aggravated about? All those things that you're struggling with? Jesus is telling me, or asking me, do you trust me with all of those things? And I'm, I, it, when I'm honest, I'm not always able to say, yeah, I, I do. Which is the whole point of him is interrupting me. He's trying to get me to, to grow in that. So how can we grow in our faith? Well, let's look at that. First of all, we need to seek faith, right? That's, that's a good idea. We need to take the initiative to either find faith if we don't actually have any, or to build up the faith that we, we do have in Jesus. And there's, I think there's a bunch of things we can do, but, but just a couple of them are, uh, we could build up our knowledge, build up our under, understanding of Jesus, right? Faith begins with belief. And belief is based on knowledge. Maybe you're not sure you believe. So that's okay. But, but take the initiative. Don't just stop there. Take the initiative. Do the work. Seek to understand the claims of faith. Seek to understand Jesus. Read the Bible. It's, it's, it's a good book. Read the Bible. I've heard incredible stories. I mean, talking to people, incredible stories where they just opened the Bible and started reading and God did some pretty wild things. Read the Bible. Read books about Christianity. There's a book, uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Anybody ever read that one? I don't know how many people over the years that I've talked to, they read that book, they had faith. And that book, and I've heard others that read it and didn't have that experience. But there's just so many great books out there that inspire and, and, and explain and help us understand what the faith in Christ is all about. And, and talk with people of faith. You know, you want to do is take the initiative. If you know somebody who has faith, talk to them. Maybe you don't have faith, they do. Talk to them about that. 
Maybe you have a little bit of faith and they seem to have more. Talk to them about that. Find out what they believe and why. The why is oftentimes what's most important. Why do you believe all that stuff? Most people that have faith, they'll be glad to tell you about it. Do what you can to get an authentic grasp so that you can ultimately make an informed decision about faith in Christ. And along with that, pray. Prayer is the greatest tool we have in terms of faith. Go to God. Go to the source and actually ask him for faith. Ask him to build up the faith that you have. One of my all-time favorite stories in the Gospels. Uh, we mentioned it just a minute ago when Jesus was like, oh, you have little faith. It was one of those stories. And, and Jesus had been on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, the one where he goes up there and he starts just the glory and radiance of him is just, just blinding for the few disciples he brought with him. He's talking with, with Moses and Elijah. But when they came down from the mountain, they find the rest of the disciples have been working hard to cast a demon out of a little boy. I think it was like nine of the 12 disciples were, I don't know, they're each taking turn. Come out! I don't know what they were doing. But they were working hard and everybody was frustrated. And the father of the child comes to Jesus just begging, would you please deliver my son? And Jesus says, all things can be done for the one who believes. And the father cries out, my favorite quotes in the Bible, he cries out, I believe, help my unbelief. Isn't that awesome? I mean, it's so totally honest. I think it's a great model for us. You know what? If you're struggling with your faith, that's okay. But pray and, and say, oh God, I believe, but help me with my unbelief too. Trust that God will be at work giving you faith and building up your faith. Okay, so seek faith. And along with seeking faith, seek to nurture your faith. Do what you can to nurture your faith. We can do this any number of ways. One great way to nurture your faith is to look back. To look backwards and to recognize all the ways that you've experienced God's faithfulness. They say hindsight is 2020, and, and there's some truth to that. Because a lot of times it's when we look back that we can see things most clearly. And that's true with God. When we look back, we can see the hand of God at work more clearly. A lot of times God's doing all kinds of stuff, but we're so caught up in the moment we don't, we don't recognize him in the midst of it all. The Israelites did this all the time. This is why they have so many holidays. We get like two. They got, I don't even know how many holidays they have. But each one of those holidays are meant to help them look back, to look back and see all of the great works of God. The works of God delivering them from Egypt. The works of God providing for them in the wilderness. The works of God showing his faithfulness in all the ways that he protected his people. Here's an here's a excellent exercise. I've done this a number of times, and every time it's been just great. Get a pad of paper and a pen and just start writing down how just the many ways that you know that you know God intervened in your life times when you know beyond a doubt that God truly blessed you, that God truly provided for you, that he truly protected you, that he guided you, that he, that he showed his love for you. Write them down, however many can come to mind. And, you know, take a little time, let it, let it, let it kind of seep in, seep in. You'll be surprised how much you write down, and every little bit of it will affirm your faith and will build up your faith in God. Another way to nurture faith is to have active relationships with other believers. This is so important for the life of faith. When we are together, we can talk. We can do what we did on our little pad of paper, you know, maybe bring the pad with you. And we can talk together and share together the different ways that we've seen God's faithfulness in our own lives. And I'll tell you what, when you start hearing the stories of your friends in the ways that they've seen God at work in their lives, it's going to build up your faith. You're going to say, wow, God is good. God is faithful. It might even help you recognize the ways he's been working in your own life. But this can also getting together with, with other, other uh, brothers and sisters of the faith can also be supportive for each other. God, God can help use 
the people around you to, 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 to do the things he wants to do in your life. Help each other out when we're down. Give each other a hand when we're in need. Be, be part of the miracle that God wants to do for each other. There's a great story in the Gospels, story of the paralytic. And we, we know the story. Here's a guy who is paralyzed. He is immobilized. Enough so we know he can't walk. We don't know how much he's paralyzed, but we know he can't walk. And so his friends get together to try to help him out. They get together and they pick him up. They make a little pallet thing and they carry him to Jesus. But not only do they carry him to Jesus, they can't get to Jesus. The, the house he's in, it's all crowded. They can't get in the door. So they dig through the roof to get their friend to Jesus. And they lower him down there. I don't know what the guy was thinking the whole time, but it turned out really well. And I love what the Bible says. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, not when Jesus saw his faith, the little paralytic's faith. It's when Jesus saw their faith. That's when he went into action and he helped the man. All of their faith together, all of these friends working together to be supportive to this guy that created the connection that the miracles worked through. I think there's an important lesson in this. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 says, Encourage one another and build each other up. This is an important part of nurturing faith. So we seek faith, we nurture it. Last, we need to exercise our faith. We need to put our faith into action. Faith is like a muscle. And if it just sits around eating ice cream, watching soaps, it's going to get limp. It's going to get weak. It has to be used. It has to be worked. Our faith has to be stretched and challenged. One thing that really struck me when we did our Crazy Love study, you know, the Crazy Love book by Francis Chan. In that book, Francis Chan asks the question, this is the one thing in the whole book, I like the whole book, but this is the one thing that got me. Francis Chan asked the question, are we living lives in which we need the presence of God and his power to be at work? Are we living our lives in such a way that we are truly needing God to be present and active in our lives? Or are we just playing it safe? Are we living our lives in a way that we really don't need God that much? We don't have to rely on his power. In other words, are we stretching our faith are we stepping out and doing the work of God, leaving our comfort zones behind, taking risks, going beyond our own abilities? God offers his power where there is faith. When we are genuinely dependent on him, when faith is a matter of truly matter of success or failure, life or death, when we do the work of God, when we stretch ourselves, giving, ourselves, giving our own faith a true workout, then we will see the hand of God at work and our faith will grow stronger and stronger. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at the harvest time. We are here for a purpose, and our purpose is to partner with Jesus Christ, our Lord, and to carry on his work of salvation in the world, to expand the kingdom of God. Jesus has called us to join in his work, and through him, anything is possible. We just need to make the connection. We just need to plug into that unlimited power source. And if we do, we will see amazing things happen. And through it all, will receive a bounty of peace and joy and love. Jesus once said, Truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here and go to there. And it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. We all know this. Mustard seeds are really small, right? They're really teeny tiny. I think of them as like poppy seeds. We just have poppy seed muffins from Costco, and I, and I like 
had it in the morning and in the, in the evening I saw that I still had that poppy seed right there. I hate that. But that's really small, right? It's just a little, it's like a little bit. But think about what Jesus said. A poppy seed worth of faith is more powerful than a big old load of dynamite. Why? Because with just that little bit of faith, you can move mountains. Faith is an incredibly important part of the work of, of Jesus Christ. It's incredibly important to his own heart. It's the center of everything that Jesus wants to accomplish because it creates the connection. The connection through which his power moves. Power to heal, power to restore, power to save, both in our own lives and through us in the world. May we, may we be a people of faith, seeking to know Jesus more and more, nurturing our connection with him deeper and deeper, and exercising our faith, joining with Jesus Christ and sharing in his work in this world. May we be a people of faith. Let's pray together. Precious Lord, we love you. And we are so thankful for your great love for us. We are so thankful for all that you have done to call us to yourself. To offer your love, your life, your grace to us. But Lord, we know that all that works through faith. In your word you say, pray for faith. Seek to increase your faith. And that's our prayer, Lord. Give us faith in you. Give us faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And grow that faith, Lord. Motivate us, inspire us, direct us so that we can nurture that faith. And help us, Lord be colleagues with you, to join in your work in this world so that our faith may truly bear fruit. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, please stand with us and sing When I Survey. 258. Did there some? 
much love and